All right. Welcome everyone to the, I believe it's the seventh week of the 2024 Soil and Nutrition Conference, the, the theme of the state of nutrient density. I'm very, very happy to welcome Megan Westgate here this uh, this week. She's a one of those people who's been doing brilliant work behind the scenes that you may never have heard her name, but you've likely you're aware of her work. Um, the Nanjima Project, um, for those who are not aware, I think it's the, what is it? The You have more more products with your label on it than anything but but kosher in the United States. Is that correct, Megan, as a, as a factoid? So if anyone's ever seen that little blue, that butterfly label on a package of food that says that this, this is um, <clears throat> GMO-free, that's uh, been Megan's work for the last almost, how many? 12, 15? I'm not even sure how many years. Many, many years. Almost 20. <laughs> almost 20. Almost 20, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I was like, I was like, <laughs> it's so. weird. I'm only 25, but yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, it's been a long time. For more than 15 years. More than 15 years. Oh my God. Yeah, it's starting to get old. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, she's the. Uh, so, the, 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 the organization, Nanchima Project, has been working on a. Um, <clears throat> A sort of a proactive, a proactive standard um, as for for food quality that uh, Megan is going to be sharing with us today. I think it's only been shared publicly a couple times. Uh, other, um, we've been part of that conversation. The BFA, I'm very honored, honored to be. So, I think I'm just going to hand it over to Megan and let her give her give her overview, and then, as is the regular pattern, we'll um, we'll do a half hour of Q and A with myself and the other panelists, and then a half hour of Q and A with people's. Um, questions they've got they've got at the end um and as always put your feel free to chat in the chat box with each other and put your um questions for megan into the q a box all right megan take it away thank you dan good morning good afternoon depending where you are good evening for some um i am joining today from bellingham washington in the ancestral homeland of the lemmy nation and the nooksack tribe um the land of high snow-capped mountains, tall cedars, rushing rivers, sparkling streams, moss ferns, deep lakes, and the vast ocean to the west, the Salish Sea dotted with islands. And I share this with an invitation for you to notice um, the nature where you are and it's by way of connecting that we can't see each other and we're virtual but in some sense we are all in a circle here and i am actually holding that there is nothing more imperative for humans in these times than for us to reawaken our capacity to be conscious of our interdependence with all life to be able to really feel that in our bodies, in our breathing, and to have that somatic, relational, emotional intelligence inform and transform our mindsets and our consciousness so that we can do our work and live and make choices and create a food system in accordance with living systems principles and in accordance with the reality that um, everything actually is a unified field. I think we're living in times where it is abundantly clear that the paradigm, the mindset that we've been operating from is, is not working. And we're going to be digging into that a little bit this morning. And the opportunity for us is to be the humans that life needs, to be the humans that this world needs for life as we know it, to survive and thrive. And I believe that part of that is for us to do things a bit differently. So I'm not launching right into PowerPoint slides. I want to take a few minutes and give us all space to um, drop into our bodies and into our place. And if you want, you can close your eyes and bring your attention to your breathing, feeling the support of whatever you're sitting on which ultimately is being held by the earth. Maybe let your belly soften just a little. And if you would image something about the natural world where you are, maybe something that's blooming or ripening in your garden right now, um, 
maybe a bird or a tree outside your high-rise apartment. Maybe a cloud that's forming in the sky. Whatever it is, choose a specific thing that brings you joy and a feeling of connection with nature, something that you can really image and examine in your mind's eye. I'm looking out at some beautiful dogwood blossoms. Just feel your appreciation for that beauty of nature. And as you breathe, now imagine not yourself separate observing it from the outside, but can you imagine what it is like to be that thing? What does it feel like to be a dogwood petal with the sun shining on it? What does it feel like to be a bird singing in the late June air? Let yourself really be with that capacity for intelligence that you have because you are part of life. You are connected to that. And just rest in that for a moment. Rest in that belonging. Belonging to the earth, belonging to nature, belonging to life. And if you would, just to help us have a sense of our circle, if you're open to sharing in the chat, maybe where you're calling in from this morning and also um, any word that represents what you were just experiencing, merging with and observing that part of nature, um, something about it that was bringing you joy or filling your heart with gratitude maybe you want to share what the thing was, but I would love to just bring some aliveness to our space together. And I think you should be able to pop things into the chat if you would. Thanks, Sherry. Breath exchange. Yeah. I mean, it's so cool because on so many levels, I mean, the actual level of oxygen and CO2 exchange. We're in this fluid relationship. And we also know now from quantum physics that um, everything is an interrelated field. At the subatomic level, things are not things. It, it's mostly um, it's energy fields, informational fields, 99.99999% at the subatomic level of space is, is actually energy. And at that level too, there's this reality that, that um, things are not particles or waves, that they're either until they are observed, which brings up really interesting questions about what is our role in conscious observation. And we're going to get a little more into that, but just looking at some of the other things that is, are being shared. The wind on my skin, beautiful, from Red, Red Wing, Montana, from Red Heart. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Uh, uh, Margaret, beauty of a bright orange Oriole, sweats flying overhead this morning in DeSoto, Kansas, along the Caw River. Green, green all around Burlington, Vermont. Yeah, I grew up in Western Massachusetts, so I can imagine how green it is there. Uh, Geraldine, thriving, a daisy on my lawn, lovely. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Just even a handful of images. Um, I know it might seem esoteric and it's a leap from, from where we normally are, but um, and that's actually a good segue for me to start sharing my slides. Ooh, Mario picked and ate a ripe pawpaw from my garden this morning. I'm curious where that was. Not, not where I live. There were two. One was half eaten by the birds. Lucky birds. And Dinah Kay, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. The smell of the lavender. 
ooh, that I'm cleaning for making oil. Beautiful. Our lavender is just starting to get ripe here. And the endless shades of green from Kenmore, Washington. Oh, this is so fun. Shauna, newly transplanted mulberry tree. Yay, from the BFA farm in Massachusetts. And it's early evening in West Cary, Ireland. Lovely. So I am so grateful to all of you who shared. It helps give me a sense and all of us a sense of this living world that we're all in, the interconnectedness and the beauty of all the places that we are. And part of why I think this is so important is, so we're going to be talking about co-creating a food system with integrity. And the world, uh, this is a, a famous Einstein quote, the world as we have created it is a product of our thinking. It cannot be changed without our thinking. And what I've noticed through almost 20 years of work in the food system um, and especially with some of my learning over the last few years is it's easy to read that and think like, yeah, that makes sense. We would have to change our thinking. Um, but what I've noticed is that in reality, a lot of the efforts that um, even those of us who are very well intentioned and very much compelled by being of service to life, um, we are unconsciously applying the same thinking and the same mindset because it's the mindset that we have been trained in and mindset is really akin to to paradigm and paradigm by definition it's like the water we swim in the air we breathe we don't really see it that's the trick about it it takes a lot of rigorous work to actually observe our minds at work and be conscious of the mindset that we're operating from um, and I am believing that there is a unique responsibility that we have in human consciousness because of the billions or maybe even trillions of species that have existed since the last common ancestor of all living things. Of all of those billions or trillions of species, humans are the only known species in all that time with the metacognitive capacity to explicitly recognize analyze and intentionally modify our own patterns of thinking, beliefs, and attitudes. Um, so what we call mindset as a distinct psychological construct. There is incredible power in this, the role that humans have in shaping reality through the way that we're observing and through what we can imagine. And I believe that that capacity and responsibility is generally unattended to sufficiently unattended. It's not sufficiently attended to in our culture. Um, we do a lot of hard work, taking actions, doing tasks, looking for results from um, what quantum physicist David Bohm co coined the phrase thoughting, which is basically repeating, recycling old thinking, not necessarily being super conscious of it. Um, so the capacity that we have with human consciousness, if we choose to use it, is to really observe what information are we drawing from to shape our thinking because that's incredibly powerful in terms of then all of the actions that we take and the way that we interplay with this unified field of reality. So I wanna look a little bit about what is the general mindset that we have now and where did it originate? And I'm gonna go all the way back, not in depth, but just to give us context, because I think with that capacity we have to be conscious and to be intentional about our thinking, it's helpful to be grounded, to notice that we have choices, to notice that those choices have changed over time and that the current mindset, which is really one of mechanical thinking, separation, fragmentation, and is not in alignment with living systems thinking, um, that that's just one way of thinking and there's lots of choices. Um, so, you know, our, our last common human ancestor was somewhere between 100 and 200,000 years ago in Africa. And 
<clears throat> what I want to point to is, so during this whole time, we were in the last ice age. And during that ice age, about 50,000 years ago, we had as humans what's called the Great Leap. It's also known as the Cognitive Re Revolution. And this was a huge leap in human cognitive abilities, technological innovation, cultural complexity, characterized by the emergence of symbolic thinking, advanced tool making, art, and more sophisticated social structures. So this is maybe the beginning of some of the capacities of consciousness as we know them now to have this, this complex cognitive capacity where we're maybe imagining futures um, that haven't happened yet and helping manifest them in a, at a more complicated level than generally other biological species do. One of the things that I want to note about this of why I'm pointing out that it happened in an ice age is um, something that I draw some heart from is that there is a lot of evidence of chaos and strife actually being really ripe conditions for biological evolution. And why I draw heart from that is that obviously we live in times that are very difficult in a lot of ways and, um, and scary and a lot's at risk. Um, life is being destroyed at unprecedented rates. And what we know from our ancestors whose um, DNA is still in our DNA is that we have that capacity and it has happened before where there is this huge leap made actually in a time of great strife. And I believe that's the potential that we need to lean into at this time is to really develop the capacity to rise to the occasion of the threats and the challenges and consider again, not just what do we need to do, but who and how do we need to be. Interestingly, there is um, a, a close connection between the invention of agriculture and um, the rise of, of some of our separation mindset. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But um, about 10 to 12,000 years ago, it was when we saw the first agriculture arising in, in multiple cultures and places. And uh, it speculated that the climate stabilization after, so this is right around when the last ice age was ending. So that coupled with population growth and resource pressure likely prompted early humans to experiment with deliberate plant cultivation and animal domestication as a more reliable food source. And then fast forward to present day, deep breath. We all know this, but being present with it can still be painful. Unprecedented rates of species extinction, ecosystem destruction, and biodiversity loss, driven primarily by human activities such as habitat destruction, climate change, pollution, and overexploitation, leading to the disruption of critical ecological processes and posing significant threats to global food security, human health, and planetary stability. And I added plus AI because that's something I've been thinking a lot about that, um, you know, there's a lot of potential, but also a lot of risk. But one of the things that excites me about AI is that I think it kind of puts the pressure on us to step up to what is our unique human intelligence? What is it that we can do that machines can't do? We have spent a long time defining intelligence in a pretty mechanical machine-like way. And the machines are more intelligent than us in those ways. But we have things that machines don't have. We have bodies and breath and emotional intelligence. And it's not an accident that these brains are attached to a whole body. And I think the more that we can learn to experience our self, our own body and system, as a unified whole, that's the foundation of a capacity of being able to see wholeness in the world. And it is also the foundation from which we can begin to explore and maybe develop more capacity around, again, what is the unique human intelligence that a machine can't replicate? And then we can leave the machine intelligence to the machines. 
<clears throat> so one of the things that I think is really interesting um, is that there is a relationship between the separation mindset and the creation of agriculture. Obviously, it's not inherent to what agriculture is. But what we saw is that at the same time that humans began exerting their will over nature to grow cop crops and raise animals, new forms of domination over humans emerged too. Um, it's really around that same time that we saw the, the foundation of patriarchy and also institutionalized slavery. Um, and so you can really see how there's the shift in mindset of we're separate from nature, we're separate from life. And then the way that we treat all of life, including our, each other and including ourselves, really changed. And obviously, I'm speaking in broad generalizations. There are exceptions to this, and, and I'm not suggesting that agriculture is inherently separationist, but I am just noting that there is a really interesting pattern of the mindset that has been deepening for most humans and, you know, most strongly in Western culture in the last hundreds of years um, with colonialism, this idea of nature is separate and it's ours to exert our will on. And that shows up in how we treat food, for example, with genetic engineering, where we feel entitled to go in and manipulate the web of life um and and then obviously all of the egregious social injustice of the inequities around how different humans are treated based on the color of their skin or their gender um their ability physically all kinds of different things um so noting this because I think it's really important, again, with that capacity we have to observe our thinking and notice how our thinking affects outcomes, is to see how this mindset of separation and more mechanical thinking of seeing everything as pieces to fit together and problems to solve allows for this domination and destruction of life that we are seeing in abundance evidence really on all fronts in our world right now. I and mean, there's, there's really no arguing with it at this point. It's painfully clear. Um, but maybe what we, what is not clear, or not attended to as much is the way that our actual mindset, which is different than mindset is not, I mean, it could be like, I want to harm life. But what I'm positing that's really important for all of us well-intentioned people is that we have been trained into a consciousness that sees things as separate. Um, going back to our little visualization a few minutes ago, it's like we observe something from the outside and we've largely forgotten our capacity to be in relationship with life in a more intimate, fluid, connected way. And so just that mindset, even when we're trying to do good things, when we're not trying to dominate or destroy life, that mindset keeps perpetuating those issues. You know, the Einstein quote of you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. That's what this is really pointing to. So if we want collective well-being of all life, which I trust we all in this call do, then we have to develop a mindset of interdependence, um, of, of aliveness and living the way that living systems work, this fluidity, this, as Sherry said, breathing in and out. And what I want to note here is that it is perfectly possible to want the collective well-being of all life and to apply a mindset of separation and mechanical thinking and those two things won't ever line up. And so that's why I am positing that it's so important for us to not just focus on the what is happening in physical reality and what actions we need to take to affect things in physical reality, although those are very important also, our responsibility for our actions that we take and the way we affect physical reality, absolutely important. But it's not enough. We have to really develop the capacity to observe our own minds at work and to hold more complexity as we do that because living systems are very complex and mechanical thinking is 
very linear. It collapses things into um, what is easy to mentally manage, but unfortunately is not true to life. And so is very limited in the outcomes that it can provide. So just to ground us a little more in some of the outcomes of this mindset of separation and mechanical thinking and connecting that to the food system, I want to look at just some of the ways that that shows up in our food. So we have we have a, a retail food system that is full of processing and additives that leads to nutrient loss. There's a lot of excess sugar and salt, artificial additives with unknown health impacts. Um, obviously, GMOs are rampant, which lead to ecological disruption, increased pesticide use, concerns about biodiversity. This is only the tip of the iceberg, really, with some of the ways these things are problematic. But um, chemical agriculture, soil degradation, water pollution, pollinator decline, pesticide residues in food. You can see how all of these things wouldn't be possible from a mind that sees life as interconnected and experiences a belonging to life. We're literally in destroying the life around us, including our the our food, we're destroying our own health too, which we'll look more at in a minute. Um, this also shows up in our human communities in terms of extractive labor practices, erosion of local food cultures, small farm decline and food deserts in low income areas. And there's overall a lack of nutrient density, which I know you all have been um, diving deep into through the course of this conference. And so you know better than most depleted soils and yield focus farming and long transport reduce food nutritional value um, and also genetics. Um, there is a huge cost to animal well being in terms of factory farms, overuse of antibiotics, stress in CAFOs, and also packaging. There's a ton of plastic pollution um, that is leaching into food. I mean, it's, it's, we're well aware of how it's harming the physical environment outside of our bodies as well, but it's um, also really disrupting our endocrine systems and causing a lot of chaos in our human bodies. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully it's pretty clear how these are things that people rooted in an understanding of interconnectedness, rooted in an orientation to the well-being of life, and able in our minds and consciousness to do work, make choices, and think with like really continually holding that in mind we wouldn't have this kind of outcome. So this agriculture system that we have is a product of this separation mindset. And there's pretty egregious human health outcomes. Poor diet is actually now one of the leading causes of death globally. It's responsible for up to 11 million deaths annually, 20% um, of all adult deaths. So it's, it's a leading cause of all cause mortality and also all cause morbidity. Um, and so also this erosion of the actual health span. So up till the point that we die, like what is the quality of our health? Western lifestyle diseases like heart disease, obesity, diabetes have become endemic in just two generations. So it's um, the consequences of this kind of food system that result from destructive agriculture practices that um, come from a mindset of separation are, the consequences are extreme and direct in our own physical bodies. Unhealthy food is a major contributor also to cancer, digestive disorders, infertility, neurological disease, and depression, as well as a whole bunch of other mood disorders. Um, and one of the realities that we have with our current food system is that 75% of our diet now comes from just 12 plants and five animals. Um, and so there's been a huge collapse in diversity and nutrients as a result. And in place of that, we have a system of ultra processing and additives that create the illusion of variety. And I wanted to highlight also just the role of 
diet on the brain because this work of actually building our capacity to operate with a new paradigm is incredibly mentally rigorous. It takes a focused, clear mind. Um, and this is a quote from a book, Limitless. A well-nourished brain is a highly efficient brain. It can adapt quickly to new information, make sound decisions, and process complex thoughts. On the other hand, a brain deprived of essential nutrients can suffer from diminished cognitive abilities, reduced memory capacity, and increased susceptibility to mood disorders and neurodegenerative diseases. So in terms of that challenge and opportunity and calling to be the humans that life needs in these times, part of that is to have a really um, healthy system and a, and a high functioning brain, and that requires good nutrition. So there's this important and interesting cyclical relationship. This is a, a premise I'm really holding is that in order for us to create a food system that nourishes life, a food system that has integrity, we have to have the will and the capacity to be oriented to nourishing life. And that requires being healthy in our own bodies, in our own minds. And there's obviously a lot of facets to that, but food is a really important one. And so I think we're probably all well aware of how food is this like nodal intervention acupuncture point for the poly crisis, changing the way that we grow food changes so much about our external environment and holds so much promise to restore balance. Um, what I think is talked about less is also nourishing food as a nodal intervention because us humans who are the ones taking all of these actions um, that are destroying life on our planet, um, we're feeling disconnected. And there's an interesting relationship between the separation mindset and the domination mindset because when we feel separate, it's actually pretty scary um, that that separation mindset is a feeling of aloneness. And it's a stark contrast in my own experience to what it feels like when I remember my belonging to the earth, my place in nature, the way that I am held in the stream of all life, the way that I am part of all of that. There is a security that comes from that reorientation that makes much different thinking possible and makes me um, have the will to want to nourish life and feel safe doing that. So there's this interesting circular relationship between a separation mindset and an orientation to domination and control where we're just trying to get things under control to get some ground under our feet because we feel scared because we're separate. So that's a different but related premise. And it's interesting, you know, I don't have a perfect answer about how we disrupt this. I have a premise that we could, it's probably not a linear process because nothing in linear systems really is, sorry, in living systems really is. Um, but there's some important relationship between us restoring our health as humans, understanding what it feels like to feel well in ourselves. And then we can draw on that to want that same wellness, that same good feeling for the life outside of us. And when you're feeling really crappy, it's hard to want well-being for anything or anyone. And again, there's a lot of reasons why we're struggling. These are hard times, but it's really interesting how many markers of health and well-being are related to food. And again, not just on a physical level, but on an emotional and psychological level, our well-being, our capacity to, to be oriented to joyfulness and healthfulness is very connected to the food that we're eating. And so I think we need to attend to all of these things simultaneously and be mindful of the relationship between them. Again, just looking at these relationships back and forth between the way that a separation mindset reinforces domination and vice versa and the alternative. So hopefully there's some inspiration here for the value of thinking from a living systems lens and learning to see interdependence. It is, as I said, um, in my own experience, 
it's a rigorous undertaking. So again, it's one thing to see like, okay, yeah, we would have to change our thinking if we want to create different outcomes, but it's not talking about changing the thinking at the what level of like, we're going to think differently about what we're doing. It's actually changing how we are thinking. Um, and I'm going to share some resources of ways that I and my team at the Nanjimo Project have been leaning into that, a huge resource and legend in the work. And I think someone Dan has had on um, in previous years of this conference is Carol Sanford, who um, teaches how to apply living systems thinking to business. Um, and and I am also a participant in something called Renourish Studio, which I'll share more about at the end, but it's um, a studio for food system leaders to do this work of changing our mindset. So I'm saying all of this by preface of we are not going to successfully completely shift our mindset in the next few minutes, but I actually do want to invite you into an experiential exercise around that. Um, so if you have a pen and paper handy, that's great. You can also just think about it inside your mind, but this is just kind of like a little taste of understanding some of the difference of a separation versus um, a living systems mindset. So first, think of a food system issue that you are passionate about and think reflect on it from the perspective of why it's a problem, what's wrong with it. Maybe you want to think about how you could fix it, but just noticing that we tend to think in terms of problems and, and this is kind of the default mechanical mindset, like what's wrong? So think about that maybe in a way that's typical for you to think about it and, and do choose a specific issue that you're particularly passionate about. I just had a whole list a few minutes ago. So maybe it's GMOs, maybe it's CAFOs, um, maybe it's inequity and in labor practices. And if you can um, make some notes about why it's a problem and what's wrong with it. And as you're doing that, track the energy in your body. So notice the thoughts you're thinking, but also to whatever extent you can, just notice how your body feels and what intelligence is coming up somatically as you think about things in terms of problems that need solutions. And maybe along with that is some mindset of like, it's your job to figure out how to fix it. Just notice what that feels like and the nature of those thoughts. And now consider that same issue from the perspective of potential. So that same thing that's moving you that you are looking at the problem of, what's the potential around that topic? What opportunity do you see? What would be the value of that potential being realized? How would that contribute to the well-being of the food system and of life on the planet. And again, just notice what thoughts you're thinking and, and how that feels in your body. I'm going through this pretty quickly because I don't know how many people came with a pen and paper, but it's something that you could come back to also. Um, from this reflection, what can you see about the difference between orienting to problems versus orienting to potential? And I'd invite you to reflect on this both in terms of the nature of your thoughts and also your somatic experience. What's different between when you think about problem versus when you think about solution? Sorry, when you think about potential. So what's different when you think about problem compared to when you think about potential? And what might that difference tell you about some of the cues for yourself of when you're in a separation mindset versus a living systems mindset? So I notice for myself, when I focus on problems, I immediately feel constriction in my body. Like um, it's almost like the separation increases. Like I pull in tighter into myself um, in the sense of like, the problems are overwhelming. How are we going to fix them? Um, 
And when I orient to potential, it's like this softening and opening. And I believe that I can see more clearly and hold more curiosity. And actually this is pretty neurologically supported too, in terms of when we have a regulated nervous system, the brain functioning capacity that we have is such that we can do better critical thinking and um, hold more curiosity and actually discovery, because I think that is a big part of what we need need to do is recognize that we don't have the solutions. Um, if, if we didn't need to change something about ourselves, we would have different evidence all around us than we do. Um, so a final question here, what do you need to restrain or develop in yourself in order to return to a paradigm of interdependence and aliveness? And maybe there's just like a note that you can make to yourself of some way of like, and I mean, I would suggest even thinking of this in terms of your work day, regardless of, you know, whatever type of work you do, what are some of the places where you fall into looking at problems and what would happen if you instead developed a habit of looking to potential? So how could you manage yourself such that you're practicing shifting your mindset, even in, in little ways with your daily work? So now I'm going to share um, some more concrete things about the work that we're doing at the Non-GMO Project and with a new project called the Food Integrity Collective. And um, and all of that work is informed by these mindsets. So as I've said before, it's not, I don't, I'm not suggesting that it's sufficient to just change our thinking and we don't have to take action in the, in the real three-dimensional world. Um, we have immense responsibility for the actions that we're taking in the material realm. I'm just suggesting that we can't fully take that responsibility in the way that we're capable of and that the world needs from us without changing our thinking too. So as we've been working at the Najimo project, here's some of the ideas and projects that we've come up with related to that. And so I'll be sharing about the Food Integrity Collective. I did just want to start with a very brief background of Najimo project history. Um, Dan spoke to some of this, but it feels important to me because because things are really daunting right now. So when we look at the, you know, in terms of the problems and the destruction that's happening, it, it can be overwhelming and it can feel like, how, how could we possibly shift this? And I really value my own lived experience with confronting that with GMOs, where when we started the non-GMO project, I started working on it in 2006 and we incorporated as a nonprofit in 2007. Um, it seemed very audacious and relatively unlikely that we would actually secure a non-GMO food supply in this country. Most people had no idea even what a GMO was, let alone the fact that they were showing up already at that point in more than 90% of our corn, soy, canola. Um, the first couple of years of doing this work, almost everyone, when they asked what I did, um, you know, it was a lengthy explanation because people didn't even know what a GMO was. Um, so it was a very uphill battle. And it also felt like imperative. Like if we don't awaken our consciousness and attend to this now, we're going to lose the chance to preserve non-GMO genetics. And really fundamental to our approach was a belief that we are all empowered co-creators of our food system. One of the things that's really different about the approach that the Non-GMO Project took from the beginning is that we focus directly on not only developing standards and certification protocols for brands, um, we also partnered with retailers. We were actually founded by retailers. I was working at the food co-op in Tucson when the project started, um, and it was originally a partnership of um, the natural grocery company in Berkeley, California, and the big carrot co-op in Toronto. So it started by retailers, and partly because of that, we had this orientation also to eaters and shoppers, which coming from a more fragmented traditional separationist approach, cert most certification systems don't engage directly with shoppers and eaters. And 
that has made all of the difference with our success. Today, there are over 66,000 verified products, and that represents more than 45 billion in marketplace sales. So we're a nonprofit. That's no, nowhere near what's coming to us. But just saying in the marketplace, that's what's represented now in products that have the butterfly on them. And so this belief that that we are all empowered co-creators of, of our food system has informed our success so far with non-GMO and is a huge part of what we're taking into this expanded work with the Food Integrity Collective. Um, so launched by the Non-GMO Project at the intersection of the making, selling, and buying of natural retail food, the Food Integrity Collective has a place for everyone. We're a grassroots movement changing the future of food by speaking truth, learning together, and co-creating alternatives to the industrial food system that is currently destroying the health of life on Earth. And there are a few specific um, aspects of our programming that I'll run through. Um, so one is that we are working on a new on-pack label. And I'll share more, a little more about that in the next slide of how we're using a living systems mindset to approach that and do certification in a completely different way than, um, than is it's traditionally done. And we're currently in a prototyping phase with that. So we're working with a cohort of select um, consumer product good brands that are helping to define baselines for each of the eight petals of food integrity, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, and helping inform design of an unpacked label that again moves beyond our current definition of certification. Um, we also, as part of that, have a web app. It's actually really integral to the unpacked label because one of the things that um, that we're undertaking with this food integrity collective approach is that we can't fragment out all of the all of the pieces of what contributes to life. So again, we have eight petals. We'll look at those in a moment. Non-GMO is one of them. There is still a place for single issue certifications, but we have been exploring for the last probably maybe close to six years now, really looking at um, the chaos and destruction in the world around us and asking ourselves, how can we as an organization make our best possible contribution to the well-being of life on earth. Um, and we felt that there was more that needed to be done than non-GMO. And so we're looking more holistically, but that also means that there's a lot more complexity and a lot more nuance. So the web app is important because it helps surface information about where given products are in their journey toward food integrity. The actual like earning of the unpack label is... Um, it's going to be a high bar and we want to be able to help um, shoppers be able to identify, for example, maybe someone has done really great work on um, sourcing from regenerative systems and avoiding GMOs and maybe they still have some work to do around animal well-being and so they could get props for the things that are going well on their journey and you know share more about where they're at in their process of, of things that they haven't um, reached a baseline with yet. Another really important part of our, our work with the Food Integrity Collective is ongoing community education and so this includes the content of just more basic learning um, about the eight petals of food integrity. We've been, as part of this work, doing more work than we historically have with healthcare practitioners, dietitians, nutritionists, and um, you know, it's easy for us coming from our bubble of the food space to think that people know more than they do, and maybe some of you are laughing, but you know, it, it turns out that actually a lot of very basic information about things that we may all understand well and take for granted are, are missing in the general population, including even with healthcare providers, practitioners. So we do want to, we want to provide education around the content. Um, but also, as you clearly know from my talk so far today, we really care about shifting mindset and developing more capacity. Um, and part of this is even from a shopper eater perspective, like we've been very limited in 
because of our binary thinking of like, this is either good or it's bad. What often happens with food standards is they have to go to the lowest common denominator of what is like, we talk a lot in our standards work of finding a balance between meaningfulness and achievability, which isn't bad. You have to find the balance of those things. Um, but our lack of um, orientation, even at the shopper level, to understanding that there is such a big gap between where our food system is and where it needs to be, that if we only have standards that are that we are like relatively confident a critical mass of products can achieve, we are not going to get where we need to go. Like the time for incremental change like that has long passed. And so part of what we need to do is to learn how to value journey and progress and evolution through time, because it's really a never ending effort, um, as I'll share briefly in the next slide with regard to our on pack label. But we are also developing a membership program um, and just other general ways to be engaged with the collective, um, including partnering with other nonprofits. And all of this is, is, as Dan said, this is one of the first times we've shared about this publicly. So it's it's very emergent in real time and also being co-created. Um, so again, we're really holding a belief that food should nourish life. Sounds so simple, right? But I think we are all well aware of how far from true that is. And we believe that together we hold the power and the responsibility to create a retail food system that promotes and restores health in humans, communities, and the broader collective of life on earth. And holding this vision that that's possible feels to me like an important use of that unique human capacity we have to vision, to imagine a future that's different than what's happening, to entrain our mindset to that and to operate accordingly. Um, so here are our eight petals of food integrity. I'm not going to go super deep into all of them, but there is more information on our website and I will just run through them. Um, and we talked about some of them in earlier slides and how they're a problem. So minimal processing and additives um, is one of the petals of food integrity that we've identified. And partly because what we are looking at with this program is, as we saw a few slides ago, this dynamic relationship between human well-being and our will to nourish life and a food system that has integrity. These are all really related. And interestingly, there's not uh, a lot of readily available information right now to average shoppers to help them know which food is actually healthy for their bodies. And minimal processing and additives is one part of that, but actually all of these pillars relate to that. Um, I'm starting with minimal processing and additives, one, because it's at the top, but also because it's really um, generally lacking in other certification systems. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is with some of the technology that's emerging, including biometric wearables, um, like continuous glucose monitors, there's a bunch of at-home testing that people can do right now to see the state of the nutrient health in their body, um, also their metabolic response, blood sugar levels. And um, I think because of that, as a food industry, it's really important to be aware that there's kind of this transparency reckoning coming where you can have really beautifully grown ingredients that are organic, non-GMO, regenerative, like as good as you can imagine. And they can be processed um, and added to such that they actually become no longer healthy for the human body. Um, and so that is an important petal of this program is actually looking at that. And, you know, there's something like 10,000 different additives in our food in the U.S., many of which have never been evaluated by the FDA. Um, companies can optionally submit them for a generally recognized as safe for a grass status, but they don't even have to do that. And there's a lot of things in our in our food in the United States that are illegal in other countries. So this is very similar to the situation we had with GMO. So moving over to that one, non-GMO is, is one of our petals. And we will initially be launching this verification program with 
the brands that are already in our non-GMO project verification program, which is about 5,000 brands at this point of all different sizes and all different types of products. We're also, I'm going clockwise here, um, we're also really valuing regenerative sourcing and biodiversity. And this is another place where, um, as we all know, it's very much a journey um, and we need to be oriented to the ongoing continuous improvement evolution practices of like, how can we grow food in a way that is better and better for life? And we can't have a static finish line. However, there are some really great standards emerging and that's our aim in this program is to um, recognize it, the work that is being done within existing regenerative certification systems, as well as potentially other things um, that are happening at the sourcing level um, in terms of ingredients being grown regeneratively and in support of biodiversity. Nutrient density and diversity is also an important one. And this is how Dan and I first connected is working on nutrient density together and really looking at this potential for food to be like really vital, nutrient dense, life affirming. And again, there's this amazing relationship between that and our human wellness. And in turn, when we are well as humans, the way that we affect everything around and outside of us, our will to be in support of life on earth and make good decisions um, for a nourishing food system. Healthy human communities is another pedal and another thing that tends to get fragmented or uh, under attended to um, but, you know, going back to that, thinking about how when agriculture first emerged, that in, in concert with that, um, for a number of different reasons, including the ways that labor was distributed with the invention of agriculture and wealth started to be accumulated and distributed, there's this close parallel between our food and subjugation of humans. And we think it's really important to result, reconcile that because truly all health is interconnected. No single person can be well and healthy if any other part of life isn't. So that's really the premise of the Food Integrity Collective and of having these eight petals is really honoring interconnectedness in all of the dimensions. And healthy human communities includes things like um, seed and food sovereignty, land rematriation, access to food. There's there's a, a lot of ways that that could look. Um, next, we have animal well-being. We upgraded this term for ourselves from animal welfare to animal well-being because I mean, that, actually, that's kind of an example of orienting to potential, just like that it evokes the sense of like, what would it feel like if the animals in our food production system actually had well-being as a priority? Um, and then the last in terms of the more defined parts of the petals is mindful packaging. Um, again, there's this, we think a lot about plastics, um, and the impact on the environment, but there's a bunch of, of PFAS of persistent chemicals that are in all kinds of packaging that are actually leaching into food. And, and so not only being destructive in the environment, but disrupting our human systems, um, uh, a lot of that in the form of phthalates, and there's a big impact happening on our uh, endocrine systems and disruption of those, and also fertility, um, as well as, of course, cancer and all kinds of things. Um, and then last but not least, we have a pedal that's other contributions to food integrity that allows some space for brands to look at what else, um, something that they are uniquely valuing that they want to make a contribution to that might not be defined in the other pillars or petals. Um, because we're not saying like, this is just our premise for how we are approaching food integrity based on a lot of deep thinking and consideration, but also it's not like the right system or the only system. There's plenty of important things that aren't on here. Um, one of a couple obvious ones, energy use, water. Um, on energy use, one of the reasons that's not on here is because our criteria for all of these was things that have an obvious and immediate 
measurable effect on both human health and ecosystem or broader environment health. Um, but energy could very well be something that a brand is working on. Most brands are. And so that's something that could, for example, show up under other contributions to food integrity. Um, this is a page from our website. If you want to uh, review more of any of these, I know this is too small for you to read, but it's more just like a teaser to go look at our beautiful website, foodintegrity.org. And you can read more about how we're approaching each of these petals. And then just a couple more words about the Unpack Label program and, and how we're thinking what it means to evolve standards. Um, so there's a few layers of it. One is just a starting line of like baseline requirements of what brands need to do. But in order to earn an Unpack Label and be part of the program, they have to commit to going beyond that starting line. So then we get into the realm of continuous improvement and year over year being able to show um, demonstrated improvement across the different petals of food integrity. And that's not necessarily, I mean, continuous improvement is not at all a new concept in terms of certification, but the way that, but it's difficult to do well to really succeed at. Um, and so we have some ideas for experimenting with different ways of holding that. And then we also are adding in a level of um, paradigm that's not typical in food certification. I, I don't, I think this is unique actually with this is that we are going all the way to the realm of potential. And so the idea here is we're moving out of a paradigm, which as I'm sure you can easily see the traditional approach to standards and certification is a very mechanical, very separationist mindset. It's very much the idea of we, the certifier, know what's right and we will tell you how to do it and we'll judge whether you did it well enough and then we'll like tell you whether you got your yes or your no. And there is a functional place for that. You know, it can help to just, you know, in the example of GMOs, like it was a successful way of kind of arresting the disorder of the proliferation of GMOs. So it's not that that has no place or can't work, but it's just, again, that it's insufficient because it's coming from this mindset of separation. And what we're really hoping for is that the potential of a food system that nourishes life of a retail food system that has integrity is something that we can't even fully see yet. And we don't want to, we don't want to define the ultimate end and outcome and potential from what we can see right now. We actually are designing into the certification process, a developmental approach to working with brands so that there can be this ongoing evolution that goes beyond what's prescribed and predefined. And a big part of this is actually working with brands to develop their capacity to see their product offerings, their sourcing, everything about their ecosystem of business from a living system lens to really see the relationship between all of the pieces of, of what they're doing. And our belief is that each, each food business is the best um, authority for itself on what are the contributions that it can make because each food business is unique. Each is nested in a slightly different way, has different customers, different products, different orientation. And that is really important to disrupt this paradigm of the certifier laying out the rules and the food company following the rules and actually awaken our capacity to think for ourselves and take responsibility for um, for that ability to see the living system around a product offering. So that's what we're working on as part of this Unpack Label program, as well as just obviously having one of the outcomes be a label on packages that just as we do with our non-GMO Project Butterfly helps shoppers easily and quickly make a decision um, that helps support a food system that nourishes life. So we would love to have you join us. This is our website and our inaugural newsletter is launching in July. So if you go to our website, you can sign up and be on the mailing list for that. And last but not least, before we go into discussion, I did just want to share 
some recommended resources. Um, these are some of the books that I've been reading that I, I read a lot of books, so this is just a, a selection, but it's some of the more impactful ones. Um, I really recommend No More Gold Stars by Carol Sanford. She's written many books. This is her most recent and really provides an excellent overview of um, some of the origins of our current way of thinking. And also she offers some frameworks and exercises for, um, for shifting mindset. Ultra Processed People is a book that also came out last year that, um, I mean, this is popping up everywhere now, all of the data on what ultra processing is doing to our food and humans as a result, but this is a, a really good book full of juicy data. Um, a book that I just started reading, The Light Eaters, The New Science of Plant Intelligence. It's incredibly written um, and I think just really valuable in terms of an invitation to consider the intelligence and consciousness of all living things and looking at the data that's emerging around, um, again, you know, through this separation mindset and really kind of treating nature as, as kind of like machines, there's an assumption that there's no intelligence or consciousness and, um, just being present with the actual data of, of what's emerging that is consistent with a living systems view of reality, which again, we know from quantum physics, but it's, it's, we're stubborn, you know, we've known some of these things from quantum physics for more than a hundred years, and we're still clinging to a separationist mindset. So for me, it just helps grounding in, um, some of the actual science around what we now know, the nature of consciousness, not just for humans, but other living things also. And then Inflamed Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Justice. It's a few years um, old at this point. It came out during COVID and it is a really important read on kind of ecological medicine and the parallels of the inflammation. I mean, part of the premise and the title is that the inflammation we're seeing with um, in a way we can think of climate change and all of the fires is like there's inflammation actually on a planetary level. And then we are also seeing that mirrored in our own physical bodies. Um, so that's a really important read also. And then I did just want to mention again, that if you're a food business interested in really diving into developing capacity with living systems thinking, Renourish Studio is a group that specifically focuses on that. Um, we at the Nanjimo Project are part of a three-year cohort, um, and they're developing shorter-term offerings now also. If you go to your, their website, you can find out more about that. But I think this summer, they're going to be doing an eight-week session, so that could be a good intro to because you know we really just barely dipped our toe into like how how do we actually hold complexity and observe our thinking in a different way um as i've said a few times now it's a rigorous undertaking and being supported by skillful resources and a community of people doing that together is is really invaluable so with that i am going to stop sharing my screen and hello back to Here we are Hey, <laughs> back into what? What were we gonna say? A, a face. I. It's just back nice to face. Else yes. face. <laughs> <laughs> it's really difficult for those who don't know uh, to talk to a computer and uh, maintain your energy and keep. Uh, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> that was wonderful. That was so the, fir the first month of COVID, I was so exhausted by that, but I've gotten used to it now. But yeah, it's a different different capacity. Yeah, we we get used to things we maybe shouldn't be getting used to. I think to maybe one of your meta points um thank you thank you very much uh, megan and really yeah this is a such a big um it's a big like like where do you even start grabbing onto this grabbing onto this because we know that you know <clears throat> from a traditional perspective you know food doesn't come in packages and isn't bought at stores and doesn't process through major multinational corporations and yet that's the reality of what a lot of people engage in and so how do you square that circle how do you really try to you know integrate the holistic <clears throat> perspective into you know as coherent a manner through the dominant paradigm we've got um i really respect your efforts to 
to to really try to unpack that and propose a strategy and a framework going forward and and um yeah yeah the, the sort of the <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of really thoughtful pieces of this that you've laid out and I hope they were they were understood by people uh, I certainly have a bunch of questions I want to I want to I want to delve into with you um I don't see that many many things in the Q and A yet there's only five or six questions um so people should feel free to post things there. Um, I will just say too, on, you know, the way that we're thinking about what we can offer is that part of taking a living systems approach to that for us has been looking at kind of nested holes and where are we positioned in the system and we're a kind of unique organization that we um, have relationships with brands and retailers and eaters. So we're at this kind of intersection. And so our thinking about how we contribute to food integrity is uniquely informed by that. And there are completely different answers and steps to take for different entities, individuals, depending on where they're positioned in the food system. You know, like someone, a, a farmer selling to a farmer's market, you know, has a whole different scope of concerns and is contributing to food integrity in their own way. So I do just want to make sure that that's clear. Like we're not saying that this is like, the be all and all one solution. It's just for our organization. It's the way that we felt that, you know, it's the beginning concepts of how we think that we can make our best contribution to a food system that has integrity. And as, yeah, I mean, that's that, that from a living systems context, you know, the wolf has a certain role in the ecosystem and the mouse has a certain role in the ecosystem. And for the the wolf to think about how it maybe could do things better is great, but the mouse thinking about how the wolf can do things better doesn't really matter. So yeah, I mean, you guys are, <laughs> I think it's brilliant because you have been doing this work for so long and you do have a major, you know, a footprint in the, in the sort of the marketplace to be able to be just really sort of working on this evolutionary, evolutionary shift is great because it's a really hard question. How do you connect labeling and certification with quality? Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, we've been talking about sort of the raw ingredient, the carrot itself or the wheat itself or the, the beef itself. But then, as you said at the beginning, you take that high quality wheat and you take the bran off of it and, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter what you made out of it. It's much less valuable. It's regenerative, it's organic, it's whatever, that's how it was produced, but actually the functional value of the human that eats it has been dramatically reduced because of the processing and how do you how do you how do you um establish a, a framework to be able to convey that and <clears throat> potentially incentivize processing etc that is more holistic so yeah, yeah. and it's with i mean part of how i see it is that just shoppers eaters have such tremendous power and you know we've seen this with non gmo when when they have informed choice and then options that support the choice they want to make, they will make those choices to co-create a better food system. And right now with a lot of these things, just as used to be the case with GMOs, people just simply don't know. They don't know that ultra processing is an issue. They don't understand what's happening to their body or the environment um, necessarily. So that's a big part of it is like waking people up, but also what I experienced in the early days of the non-GMO project is like part of why people didn't know about GMOs is because there was no empowering action to take. And so it's hard to like take the bad news and then be like, the only thing you can do is what sign a petition or something, not to knock the value of signing petitions, but it's like, it's limit. There was limited ways to like, I actually can take action here. And so I really believe from my observation and lived experience that that's a huge part of how we protected a non-GMO food supply is by people were willing to learn about GMOs because they had a non-GMO choice. And that's, I think, such a key part of how we change the food system is that eaters need to be informed and engaged and then be be provided access to the choices so that they're willing to learn about processing, ultra processing, because they can choose a, an option that has been minimally processed. And so then it feels like safe and okay to, to learn the bad news about like whatever excess sugar or weird chemicals or whatever, all like crazy stuff going into our food. <laughs> and I've been making this. Really out of hand. What's that? It's really out of hand, like really, well, really bad. <laughs> it's really bad. And, and I've been making the point for years, like 
you call it junk food. And I'm like, it's either junk or it's food, but let's like, is there some way we can differentiate between the two? Because this stuff we call food that is actually highly processed and full of toxins. I mean, maybe we should stop calling it food. Like it just like, it just, but anyway, that's been one of my rants. I mean. Well, that's <clears> one <throat> of the things in the ultra processed people book, ultra yeah. processed edible substances. And my naturopath mentioned this to me recently too, that in the medical community, it is, they're starting to distinguish between food and, and ultra processed edible substances. I, I just want to draw a, sort of like a, <clears throat> out a couple of, of of foods that just to sort of elaborate the point, because I think a lot of the things you've been saying are maybe a bit, you know, like at the 20,000 foot view or 30,000 foot view, but like from a practical standpoint, I was, I was yesterday in Ireland and at a place um, that they had a cafe and, and um, I was getting on the, I was, I was going to take a plane over here to England and, and they were giving me some stuff like, Hey, you take some of this and we love from our, from our little, from our little shop. And, and, um, like, can you want some bread? And I was like, oh, I don't usually eat bread. Like, it's sourdough. I'm like, oh, it's sourdough? Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, okay, sure. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll eat, I'll eat sourdough bread. I don't, but I mean, I don't usually don't eat bread because uh, when I was over here a couple, I don't know, a few months ago in Scotland, I was at this place and this guy was a really deep, you know, grain researcher, producer. He makes his flour and da 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 da. He was explaining to me how most bread is made. And, you know, beyond the fact that you take the, the, the germ off, which is where most of the nutrients are, um, you know, it's not even, it's not even like risen with, with yeast anymore. There's, they take this flour and they put in a chemical like that, that causes it to expand really fast. And then they cook it really fast. And so it's like a 15 minute process between flour and what we call bread, that thing that you can squish and doesn't sort of bounce back. Right, but it's we call it bread. I mean, it is so far from what our ancestors ever consumed. And we have this thing about gluten intolerance, blah, blah, blah. And like maybe it's just that we're calling these things bread that 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 I mean it like is it even? I mean, how, how do you define it? If 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 the right. essence of bread was something that was like like mm. slowly f fermented and made and pre-digested and and was the whole grain itself. Um, that's one example. And another example is like something like salami, right? Like, which traditionally 200, 500 years ago was a, you'd, you'd slaughter the animal and you'd, I mean, you'd take the herbs and spices and you'd, you know, mix them all up with the meat and you'd, and you'd put it in the, in the, in the gut, you know, the, the sort of the, the, um, yeah, the gut, <laughs> the tube and you'd hang it and it would, it would ferment for, for months. It would hang. It's a way of, 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 you know, storing, meat over time without freezers and things and that is such an entirely different product than all the than the thing that you buy in the store or the bologna that you buy in the store i mean these are traditional foods that you know were health beneficial but are but we have now the things in the product in the store that are just so far away from it and so um yeah, yeah. i'm gonna stay with that example so under the the um food integrity pedal of minimal processing and additives as I explained, within each petal, we're going to have like the baseline requirements. Um, and we've done a fair amount of work to identify what those might be and then continuous improvement and then potential. But in terms of the baseline requirements and continuous improvement, part of that is assessing what we know about different types of processing and what the effects are. And so like the way that you described bread is made, that's an extrusion process. Extrusion is used... Um, to create all kinds of food, like a lot of cereal is puffed in that way. Yeah. Um, and at least one food scientist I've talked to has, has posited that that might be a particularly harmful type of processing when it comes to human health. So we're digging into the research and the data that's available just to understand what are the things that we would want to say, this absolutely can't be there. And we're, you know, thinking like, obviously, an obvious example under that pedal is like chemicals that are illegal in other countries. Like obviously those can't be, that's like the very bottom baseline. But I mean, seriously, there's no way just as with GMOs before, like there's no way right now for shoppers in the United States to avoid those things or yeah, to even know that they should be. Um, but yeah, it is really interesting learning all the different 
and and there's debate about the definition of ultra processing too but there is um the the nova classification which came out of brazil is what's used for most of the studies and there's a clear correlation between even like a 10% reduction in consumption of ultra processed food i think has like a 15% improvement in health outcomes so studies like that are using the nova classification and it's like on you know large sample sizes very statistically valid showing that even when you don't define processing perfectly because that's hard to do that there is um there's a meaningful correlation so yeah that's part of what we're diving into is all those different that's great to have some specific examples thank you yeah yeah well i just i mean so the the puffing you know like the like puff rice and stuff like that like you the, the amount of pressure you have to put that rice under for it to do that puffing mm -hmm. actually completely changes the biochemistry right it mm -hmm. totally shifts the the nutrients in that rice if you take I mean, I, I've, I don't have access to a local raw milk dairy and I like to have, mm -hmm. I like to have milk and I like organic milk and, and grass fed milk. And the only organic grass fed milk I have access to within a 20 mile radius of my house is the stony field grass milk. And proudly on the label, it says UHT pasteurized and people don't necessarily know what UHT is, but it's basically you're taking that milk and you're bringing it up to like, was it 800 degrees Fahrenheit or something? I mean, it's, it's flash. It's, it's like the temperature it gets put through completely changes the the structure of the compounds in the milk itself. And that's why it stays shelf stable for a month, but maybe that's not good. You know, you know? it's so interesting. This is a great example because um, I'm with you on the raw milk. I have a seven year old and a 10 year old and like, that's the kind of milk we want to give them. But now we have avian flu jumping into cows. So this is an example of how like why we can't have static rules of like this is like there's trade-offs, right? Depending on what's happening in the natural environment, we don't have standards about milk yet, but I'm just like thinking even as a shopper or as a mom, like I made a choice. We were in Eastern Washington last week kicking off this kid's school vacation and there was a, um, a local dairy in Twist, Washington, beautiful glass bottles, like beautiful milk. And I really wanted to buy the raw milk. And I've been watching the data coming out about avian flu. And I was like, I mean, there's obviously no evidence yet of it going from milk into humans as far as I've tracked. But, um, you know, that's just an example of how like, because life lives and things evolve and things change, then it's really problematic to have a static set of rules. And also it's really important to have transparency. And that's maybe the kind of thing we could shed light on in the web app. I mean, I'm just using this as an example. This that structure doesn't exist yet, but um, for people to be able to make an informed choice, like, okay, here's the situation with avian flu and cows now. So like, you could choose ultra um, high temp pasteurization. That's going to completely change the nutrient profile, like how nourishing it is. I don't know. Is it even worth drinking anymore? <laughs> Depending. <laughs> Can your body digest it? My Can your body digest it? My kids are happy about it. I don't know if this was ultra high process, ultra pasteurized though. Yeah. Um, but Yeah. But at the same time, like managing against other risks. And this is why it's important within the umbrella of the Food Integrity Collective that we're not just quietly behind the scenes doing standards and certification, but this concept is like very community engagement and participatory yeah. and transparent um, because, yeah, things are always changing. And there's there's really always like trade-offs and things that we need to reconcile depending on our values and choices. But having a framework where that, all is being openly, you know, discussed and delineated, and there's a there's a a point of of contact where, where that can be discerned and engaged. I think is really exciting. I mean, I, I think the One Health is the sort of the shorthand I use when I talk about you know what you're doing and and that concept of the soil health and the animal health and the you know, ecosystem health and the human health and you know is there some way to actually tie that all together into a framework and a and a certification label because. I'm just not aware of that happening anywhere else. And certainly, you know, <clears throat> perfection, we don't have any idea what that looks like, but at least starting honestly to engage the conversation and 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 name the pieces and 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 iterate, I think is is I mean you have to start somewhere. So 
Yeah, I, I really it, appreciate it. I mean, we, I was pretty stuck for honestly a couple of years holding this aim of like, we actually, when we first started this work, we're thinking that maybe a bunch of people are asking us to create a regenerative certification. Like, oh, that would be great. You guys know how to make good, rigorous standards and, and market and communicate those to eaters, like do that. So we started exploring that and like pretty quickly realized that, you know, to a truly regenerative mindset, that's another term for a living systems mindset, like seeing the interconnectedness of all things that we couldn't just focus on soil health or just on any one piece. And so then it's like, okay, if you have to look at the interconnected life and well-being of the whole food system, how do you do that? And the unlock really was like what you just said of like, we, we can't approach it the way that standards and certification typically have been, or in the way that we have with non-GMO, certainly where even though we do have regular standard revision periods, public comment processes. Um, it's still a static standard that we are defining the endpoint and the rules. Um, yeah. There's no like, and then what else are you going to do after that? And so that really was the unlock to be like, how do we actually look at building a system of certification process that values continual evolution into potential and, um, that's not going to be simple because it requires a change in mindset of brands too. And it might even seem naive, but I am bolstered by this idea of like this again, unique capacity we have as humans to, to vision, to vision the reality that we want for our children and for the children of all species on the planet. Like what could that be? And I, and I feel like there is something freeing in a way of being in this time of like, it's so abundantly clear that business as usual isn't working. And so like, what do we have to lose in being audacious? <laughs> Everything to lose and not Is there any other lost. option? <laughs> there's, it feels like there's no other option. So yeah. well, here yeah. we are. Well, I think I just, a couple of things are brought up for me in that. One is that, you know, speaking to the regenerative certifications and and the movement broadly, and that's, I'm not sure how many years it is old now, I think it's roughly less than 10 to, mm -hmm. to you know, since it's been meaningfully discussed. And, and you know, I've sort of um, been a bit dismissive of that attempt to create a new label and, okay, we've had organic and we've had local, we've had these sort of single factor identifiers. And if it is binary, then it's a black and white, then how do you do it? And you've got you know, various different organizations working to come up with, with standards and um, yeah. And, and, and what you're doing is, and, but there's this sort of like regenerative, it kind of means, you know, you didn't till and maybe there's more soil carbon and it's kind of better for the environment, but what does it exactly mean? And, and I think it's, I mean, I really feel like there's a, there's a whole subset in the regenerative movement, at least as I would say in the U S um, where I'm obviously more well-versed that, there's a different way of looking at it. It's like regenerative is a way of thinking. It's a, it's a, it's a systemic, holistic, you know, it, you know, review of, of all the aspects. It's not just level of carbon and how much did you till. It's much more of like an internal, you know, you know, reworking. And I think, I mean, I, I just, I, I find, I have found people all over the place who were all thinking that way. And I'm like, wow, it's great. There's like this whole there's a generation of people that are actually getting this thought. And, and I have, I have tracked it down to, to Carol Sanford. I think that, you know, you mentioned her there at the end and I'm like, it ends up when I actually talk to people who are thinking that way, they all have some relationship to Carol Sanford. So for She's whatever that, is, that's a data point that I feel pretty comfortable, comfortable saying and, and, and renourish what you're doing with Lauren, Lauren Tucker, um, mm -hmm. right. Is, is of that, of that lineage. And so for those who just like want some context about where this is coming from, I think, you know, I think there's there's some there's some aspects of the regenerative, you know, process or conversation that are really just going towards a, a binary label and like a, you know, but but this is there's a, it, I really am excited about that sort of deeper, um, <clears throat> humble revisioning completely from in from inward. It's like you can't maintain your corporate structure mm -hmm. and just have and so carbon was more. And be properly regenerative. It's really about a whole a, a re an evolutionary process. So I just wanted to emphasize that. I'm not sure if I captured it. Well. I think and just also honoring that all of this thinking is 
you know, very rooted in indigenous wisdom. Precisely. And yeah. Carol's grandfather was Mohawk and she spent a lot of time with him growing up. And so like the foundation of her work is there's seven principles of living systems of regeneration and we, and those inform everything about this work, but you know, a lot of it is about essence and potential and interconnected nestedness and also ongoing development. Um, so yeah, she is an absolute and legend and yeah. And it was when I first, I think it was about three years ago is the first time that I came across her and this conference on regenerative business. And I was so confused because I was just so steeped in the food world of like, like what you were just describing, like regenerative is a set of agriculture practices. So it was just a whole flip to be like, oh, regenerative is actually a way of thinking. Which, you know, is back to that indigenous mindedness and that, you know, whole systems thinking and, you know, seventh generation. And I, mean, I think we, uh, we had, Carol on at the conference in 2021 and and Reginaldo has the Marroquin as well for a few different sessions, really emphasizing that. Like I think the way Reginaldo says it is, is um, you know, we are all indigenous to earth. People may have they may be native to a certain place, but we're all indigenous to earth. And the question is, how deep is our is our relationship? You know, it's just we have that capacity, all of us do, even though we may be coming from a, you know, a white white background or you know our, our our progenitors weren't living here recently or whatever um but it's more about the state of mind and i think just want to acknowledge that and respect that and what i see in this work is that it's deeply coming from that place and um yeah certainly you're not done yet or barely even launched but just want to want to shed light on it and and um we'll see how the collaboration and synergy can can proceed but at least there's a framework there that feels like it's got <laughs> potential to be really, really like, new. Like, yeah yeah and from that living systems perspective you know my hope and my belief is that the material realm outcomes of our efforts will be different than what we're envisioning in this moment you know, we can have an aim. Hopefully there will be an unpack label, but the hope is that also we're doing the work in a way where we are being a resource to other entities that we are nested around and that the things that, you know, even people on this call today, like how each of us lives our lives, the choices we make, like we can't measure that in traditional linear ways we don't know what all of those outcomes will be, but that's one of the other seven first principles of, of living systems is fields, which is, you know, what we know from the quantum is like that ripple effect, who knows what will come of it. And maybe something will happen. Um, I mean, I think quantum shifts is really the level of shifts that we need given what's happening in reality, like trying to do like cause and effect problem with solution that's where we get completely overwhelmed because i don't think we ever can get there that way so we need to drop into the knowledge we have around really the importance of our way of being as we work because again at the subatomic level things are 99.99999% just an energetic field so how are we contributing and being in that field and yeah there is a lot of humility to it as you said or excitement you know, because yeah, if that is actually the way the world works, then mm -hmm. this linear tracking and tracking things out is just a head trip. It's actually not real, right? That whole way of like LCA kind of thinking is like, it's actually foundationally flawed in the physics. And the reality is the field, the ripple. Um, we can see that yeah. in our world, right? Like we can yeah. see that that's that approach is very limited. Yeah. compared to the shifts that can happen otherwise again it's both it's our mindset and the actions that we're taking but yeah. it's so important the way and this is why it's taken us a few years to develop this concept is because we are really holding the whole time like our consciousness our orientation our way of thinking is the seeds within this and like will affect everything that comes from it and so we need to be really conscious about that and yeah, I want to get to the questions because we've got a few now added up and we've only got 25 minutes left. But one last thing is, as I understand it, this has been something you've been struggling with for a number of years. This is not, I mean, with at NGP, you know, NGMO Project, you guys have been, you know, doing great work for almost 20 years, but you've known there's more to it than just not GMOs. And it's been a deep, like, 
what is the pro, not the not the anti. And so I just want to, you know, acknowledge that, you know, what you've been coming up with is is come from a deep a deep digestion <laughs> process it, that it, it didn't just like spin up in six months or something. What's that? Oh yeah. Well, in and in my experience, and a lot of that has definitely we're part of um, the I participate in the regenerative business development community with Carol. Um, as well as Rainer Studio. And so I've been in deep work for a couple years now, like ongoing deep work. And it does take a certain level of humility because for us to change our mindset requires us to not know. Like it's a recognition of like willing to let the ground drop out from under your feet. And for those of us who have been successful in the material realm and accomplished a lot, you know, I've operated a lot from a mindset of like, I'm going to get done. Like, here's my plan. I'm making it happen. And I, again, value that there is a place and a time for that. Um, and it is particularly difficult for those of us who have been successful using that separation mindset to be willing to go back into the space of not knowing and basically let your brain and consciousness be repatterned. Um, yeah. and that's what it takes. It takes time. So yes, it has been years. Thank you for acknowledging that. Well, I just really respect <laughs> the like, fact that you've been sticking with it and like, <laughs> and finally you're here with like, I, we think we might have something and we're willing to share it and it's not an answer. It's a process, yes. um, which is yeah. what the biodynamic people say, you know, <laughs> it's a process. Yeah. So with that segue, I'll just jump into questions here. And I think there are some of these questions as I've been reading through them that are more about specific answers. And we you may not have specific answers, but I'll just give you the chance to comment. But some of them are more just sort of acknowledgement. So I'll start reading them and 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 you can respond. And if there's some that you wanna 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 speak to, I'll let, feel free to bring them up too. Um Henry's uh point here, he says, I watched the natural food morph into organic in the 1960s. Natural food movement was make it better in all ways possible, and we lost ground moving to prescriptive rules. I'm mm-hmm. empowered by your total system thinking. Mm. Yeah, um, it's so interesting. I've been thinking a lot about that the last couple of years. How it started started as health food movement, right? And like mm-hmm. it, the healthfulness of food was really central. And that was totally the point. Like, People wanted food for their families. <laughs> Yeah, I grew up, um, my mom was a working volunteer at the food co-op in Brattleboro, Vermont, and some of my early memories are in the, I don't even know where, I think on Elliott Street was an old, like, location with, I just remember, like, the smell of the bulk section and the wood. I know that co-op in Brattleboro you're talking about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're in a fancy huge beautiful now, now they are now it's they like are, continue to expand but in the early 80s it was in a, a different location altogether anyway um yep. but it was just like that I have that connection to the roots of like this is about being healthy and then yeah it's gone it's gone way off course from that and so that is kind of what we're trying to come back full circle to and if you go to the natural products expo west in Anaheim <laughs> the side uh-huh. was- my feeling about going there, what it does to your nervous system, it's like 80,000 people. And it's like literally the most artificial place experience is just so far from those roots of like natural, healthy food. So yeah, there's some reclamation to do. And that is where you did formally announce this first? In Uh, March? I shared a bit about this at the Provender Alliance conference, so closer to home up here in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm trying to remember what even happened at Expo West this year. I No, I, I talked a little bit about it. I was on a panel with Rainer Studio talking about living systems thinking, and I shared a little bit, and then we did a happy hour. We have a, you know, a booth on the trade show yeah. floor. We did a food integrity happy hour, and that was kind of our launch, but we haven't done an in-depth talk like this. For the public so this is the first all right well <laughs> the, the sherry hess who i'm guessing you might know says this is so exciting megan when do you anticipate launching this or is this the official launch or is it just kind of a rolling process i mean i guess that's what we just discussed yeah, it's, it's happening hi sherry love you glad you're here um yeah. she's in renewer studio with us okay so. Brilliant. Yeah. um <clears throat> 
It is. So we're starting the brand cohort in August and that's you know, like a close to a year long process that we're really developing the standards. And I don't know how long it will take for us to actually get to having an on-pack label where we already have some initial development of the web app and we're integrating that with product finder capabilities we have in our non-GMO project database. So yeah, it's actively underway and, and also like parallel stream, like new visioning, emergent ideas. Like I said, our newsletter for the general audience public is launching in July. So there's a lot kicking off this summer and then like a lot that will be emerging over the course of this year also. So people who want to be kept abreast of it should go to the website and, and give it, give you the email and, and just as a general citizen, be kept abreast in that way. If you're part of a food company, you're, you say a cohort, basically you're starting a, a process where a few companies say, we want to do this. You're going to start working with them to figure out which products do you want to work with? And then we'll just talk it out and figure it out, you know, iteratively. Is that effectively? Yeah, because we have, we've done a lot of work actually on yeah. positing different potential baselines, doing a lot of research to be informed of like, where might we want to draw different lines? And now we need to get in there with food companies and actually be looking at their specification sheets, their sourcing processes, their certifications. and like, really testing out our thinking and also figuring out how to translate all of that into data that can be surfaced in a web app. Um, and also we're looking at how to create data such that it can be integrated with other apps. So for example, you know, there's apps people use to monitor their glucose where they can identify specific branded foods that they ate. And we're curious about being able to link data on like, how did this product score with regard to minimal processing and additives, for example, and what might the relationship be between that and the metabolic response that someone has. So figuring out how to find the right balance of like capturing a bunch of nuance and translating that into data that actually is accessible and usable for regular people is, is a lot of the work that we're diving into now. God, that's going to be complex. It's complicated, but the good <laughs> really, <is> really complex. <laughs> we know what we're doing. I did not know when I, when we started the non-GMO project, I did not know how, and granted what we're talking about now is way more complicated, but <clears throat> our standard is dozens of pages long. And I was just, I was working at the food co-op in Tucson thinking like, we should find out which products are non-GMO and put a label so that all these people are coming in asking for non-GMO food. And there's no way to reliably tell them like, let's solve that problem. And, um, I didn't have, like, I did not understand the food supply chain at that point in time. So I am deriving a lot of confidence right now of like, we are a experienced, accomplished standard setting organization. We know how complicated the food system is. We know how hard it is to track all of these things, to manage quality control, to integrate data within a database. And we're doing it anyway. So we know how complicated it is Go and girl. we're well resourced to tackle it. <laughs> and I, I love our team that they're up for the challenge because our yeah. whole team is people who are passionate about food integrity. You know, yeah. they want to make a contribution. So we're all willing to work hard. I remember you sharing with me some of the nuances of how complex it is and what all the things are you're tracking in non-GMO. And I mean, the ingredient sets and the evolutions with with um, gene splicing and I mean, all the different, you know, CRISPR stuff. And it's just like, my Lord, I mean, it really is quite impressive what happens behind the scenes there. And um, yeah, it's Thank no small feat. It's no small feat. I agree. Our team is amazing. We have three full time just researchers tracking now what's happening with biotechnology because that also has you know the landscape has totally changed from when we started the product project and it was just a handful of crops and now it's like we're tracking hundreds of different companies doing all kinds of crazy genetic engineering and <laughs> it, yeah, it takes it takes three full-time researchers even to have a chance so i'm glad we're doing stay it. on top of the things that are being the new CRISPR things that are being released and then even then and then now you track them to the supply chain anyway yeah. all right we're digressing um <clears throat> let me see um and doug interesting presentation megan my understanding from what you have said so far is most of the impact is from retail education and impacting eaters purchasing decisions is there also an element of impact on changing governmental legislation and standards? Mm. 
Yeah, definitely. And I would say this is an example of where understanding the nestedness principle of living systems thinking is helpful. So the reason that we are focusing on the approach that we are is because of where we're positioned in the food system. Um, as an example, so like legislation is a good one. Like that's not where we're positioned. It's not where we have the majority of our relationships or connections or experience in how to influence policy, but that is incredibly important. And thank God there are people who that is their expertise. Um, we talk a lot. Also, another example of this is like on farm practices, the non-GMO project is that's not our main area of expertise. And that's another part of what we're designing into this system is like honoring that there are like you said, um, Dan, with your analogy of the the wolf and the mouse, it's like we all have our different niche within the ecosystem yeah. of life on earth and we all need to play that part to the fullest of our ability, like expressing our essence in relationship to where we are. Um, so absolutely, I think that legislation and policy is important and it's just not our focus. And my my general comment is, you know, when enough people start doing things, then maybe the government will follow along. But until we start leading, probably they're not going to be uh, <laughs> on the cutting edge yeah, of all. Well, yeah. And I am truthfully a bit um, disenchanted with government approach when it comes to GMOs. I mean, that's really when we started the non-GMO project, we were looking at Europe where there is a lot of government legislation and we were like, well, that's not happening in this country. So we better take matters into our own hands and create a private nonprofit solution. Um, and then a few years in, there started to be movements actually for state level initiatives for GMO labeling yeah. like Prop 37 in California and a number of states actually passed decently meaningful GMO legislation. And then what happened is that the federal government, who had never been interested in this topic until then, stepped in and created its own national legislation as a way of superseding all those state laws and, and basically taking knocking the legs out from under them. That's why we have a Bioengineered Food Disclosure Act in this country, is because big food companies wanted to prevent the disclosure transparency that was happening at the state levels. And so in its place, we got a very, very, very watered down national legislation that really only served to emphasize the importance of non-GMO project. So from my experience, I do really value the power of eaters, especially, but everyone who participates in the food system to co-create what it is without needing rules from the government because i believe again we have the information and good choices we do make good choices we don't necessarily need them to be mandated but that's just a i do think there are places where legislative approaches are important and i definitely honor and respect the work that's happening there it's just that's some of my personal experience with government Involved. Can I just say that a little more clearly? I mean, there was a, a very powerful, you know, momentum in the in the food movement in the early 2010s in the United States to get labeling, you know, regulations in states saying that foods that have GMOs have to be labeled in California, in Vermont, in Connecticut, whatever it was. And when they started to get passed, well, first it was a bunch of pushback to resist them, but then finally the ones that were passed, the government, the U.S. government, federal government came in and said, actually, we're making a law saying that all those state laws that came from bottom-up pressure are no longer, like, relevant. Like, we're, we're, we're canceling them. So instead of the government actually moving in to be supportive and empowering, it actually was used to crush the system, crush crush the, the incentive of the movement. Yeah, that's my general I mean, imp impression about the state of politics currently is that I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, what? this is a great idea, but shouldn't the government be doing this? I'm like, well, whether the government should or should not be doing it, the reality is the way the government's working right now, it's likely not going to. So that means we need to take the power ourselves, the responsibility ourselves to do this work and not hand it off to master, as I call it. But <clears throat> I digress. But tell us what you really think, Dan. <laughs> I didn't use any vulgarities. <laughs> I, I dropped no specific I, names. 
I almost Ooh. asked you, I almost texted you yesterday to ask if swearing was allowed, but I restrained myself. So I just <laughs> we try to maintain a, a, a modicum of, of uh, propriety. In this. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> this channel here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right, we got 10 more minutes. I'm going to run through a few questions here. Um, Carol, what is the difference between regenerative sourcing and biodiversity? And another pedal with nutrient density and diversity. Overall, the pedals are great, but this can be misleading, especially if they score well on processing. These are more technical yeah. questions. No, that's great. Um, so the reason that we added biodiversity into the regenerative sourcing pedal is because kind of related to what you were saying, Dan, of that regenerative regenerative agriculture practices can be approached in a way that doesn't necessarily consider biodiversity as an important outcome. So we just really wanted to track those together, that the way that we're defining regenerative is that biodiversity is an important part of that and that we would be looking to see, like, how are you thinking about measuring, looking at biodiversity as a key outcome of the, the agriculture practices. Um, so that's why that's there. And then nutrient density and diversity, we put, um, diversity there because one of our thoughts about that is that there's like levels of thinking about nutrient density so obviously there's the level of like in this particular crop what is in this plant what's the nutrient density and then there's also like the nutrient density of the diet as a whole and that's what we're trying to capture with the word diversity there because as I shared earlier we are now down to I think it's 60 percent of our diet coming from it might be more um 12 plants and five animals. So that collapsed. 75. 75, 75. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. That was, I, that was literally one of your slides. I took notes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's what we're looking at. Like, because, and it relates to on a practical level, some of the things that brands are doing to practice regenerative agriculture is more crop rotation and more specialty crops and more like maybe unfamiliar crops. And we want to recognize that and give props to that also of like, let's see the reintroduction of not, you know, not having everything made out of corn, <laughs> just for example. I mean, there's other, there's other plants too, but if you've ever seen the movie King Corn, well, that's really compelling just how many things they turn corn into. And that's basically so that's the concept there is we're valuing the nutrient density of individual ingredients and also just within the mix of a product, just giving some props and appreciation, like when people are bringing in different sources, maybe, you know, ancient heirloom things. Cool. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, Claire, is there a specific example of nutritional absence in food today and impacts on the brain that could be given? Thanks so much. Say that again. Um, what is there a specific example of nutritional absence in food today, and impacts on the brain that could be given? I have. Um, I have. Yeah. Go. I mean, I'm just thinking like omega fatty acids is a, one of the exactly first ones right. that come to mind. Like we need that for brain function. It's a kind of classic example. Um, that book, Limitless, that I shared a quote from, has a whole chapter on food and the brain. I mean, it's cool because it's a book about, I think he's, he's worked with some crazy amount of fortune 500 companies. The book is about like being limitless in your effectiveness and the function of your brain. And there's a whole chapter on the relationship between food and your brain. I was just giving a, a, a one of my two day courses in Wales um, last week, and it was hosted at this place <clears throat> that's owned by a guy named Patrick Holford, who's been um, in the in the nutrition supplements, you know, kind of reality for 40 years when he worked with Linus Pauling. Um, he's got an organization called foodforthebrain.org, which is a really, really cool nonprofit here in the UK. And, you know, you can send off for a sample and they can do a simple little blood test and they can check for key nutrients that should be there, which will keep you from getting Alzheimer's and things. A really, really simple. And, um, <clears throat> So just a minor aside, foodforthebrain.org, if you're curious about brain health and being able to assess what is and what is not in your system that would correlate with brain health with completely solid science, um, that's a place to look. But yeah, the Omega-3, Omega-6, the Omega-3, Omega-6 we were talking about um, with, with Ken Hamilton on the second week, um, mm -hmm. and I think uh, John Umhau from the NIH, um, 
you when I mean, as I've been saying now for this conference, if you if you feed your chickens and pigs grain, even if you're organic and even if they're you know pastured, they're likely to have not enough three and too much six. So um that omega six omega three ratio is massively important. Childhood, you know, nursing, pregnancy, you know. As a mother, when you're nursing, if you don't have great omega-3, omega-6 ratios, your milk doesn't have in what your child's brain needs to develop, which is so massively important. And seed oils, you know, basically all animal products, you know, I mean, there's like, there's some basic aspects of our diet that are just really <clears throat> helping to set us in the wrong direction. Um, and okay. it's interesting because there's like, yeah, what the nutrients that we need, which I know is what the question is about. And then there's also the toxic load of things that we don't need and how that impacts brain health. Um, you know, a lot of our diet is very inflammatory and that does not help your brain health. Antinutrients, Just they call them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Dina asks, is growing food hydroponically a legitimate path forward in the context of urban ag, meaning an acceptable method of production among other regenerative methods, productions? I know the answer, but don't own evidence. I'm not sure if you want to speak to that quickly. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I was just talking about that with a friend the other day, and we haven't gotten into that like within this new standard yet. We have not given consideration yet to hydroponics. Um, but obviously, from a living systems perspective, when you take away the soil, <laughs> there's... So might, yeah. yeah. Um, it's not going... Mm -hmm. like. We're starting to be able to measure and track and therefore value more subtle complexities of the natural world, but there's just still so far to go. And just, you know, the fact that, you know, the majority of our cells by quantity in our bodies are not human. So this relates very much also to the relationship between our human health, our food, the environment. So if you grow food in a closed system with water and extracted chemicals. I think it's interesting. No it, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. No microbes. Um, there's, and like, who knows what else, like you mentioned sunlight, Dan, it's like, and we can measure some of that, but it's also like a lot that some of us still might just be a felt sense. But I think the science is coming to show like, Oh yeah, that thing that we are feeling like, Oh, there's something not quite right. Like more and more, we're actually having hard data that confirms those intuitive knowings. Um, and it also makes me think about that example with milk earlier and like, well, are there cases where someone might choose to have pasteurized milk as a trade-off? You know, I think there's, there's a lot of complex considerations around the potential value of hydroponics in, like in the example in cities, um, where there's population pressures and, you know, lack of access to soil. It's not like a simple, like hydroponics are bad or hydroponics are good, but those are like some of the considerations that I think we would want to be holding around it. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're running out of time, but I'll see if we can fit a couple more in here. Um, Yasim asks, can you give examples of personal work you and your team have done for shifting to a more systems mindset over the last few years? Do you have recommendations as ongoing practices? Oh, yay, I love that question. Well, again, yeah. um, Working with Carol has been amazing. She is in an active dying process and I'm not sure that she's bringing in new cohorts and she yeah. is dying with every bit as much grit and grace as she has lived her whole life and you know, learning from it and sharing her learning and developing herself in relationship to it is just beautiful. Um, Rainer Studio is a very thriving thing, again, with a number of different offerings. One of the things that I haven't mentioned today that has actually been really impactful for me and we have done a bunch of work with in our organization is the Conscious Leadership Group. They have an amazing website of resources. Um, they have a book, The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. So that's something that you could check out. And then their website has a lot of different visualizations and practices. And a lot of it is about just developing the capacity to observe ourselves, develop that like witness mind that is the precursor to be able to choose a different mindset, to be able to choose anything about how we're thinking. We first have to be able to observe ourselves. Um, and obviously that's the business of like most esoteric spiritual traditions. The conscious leadership group has taken a lot of that wisdom and applied it for 
a business setting. Um, and, and so we've done a lot of that work as a staff of, of just like one of the models frameworks they have is just a simple line and a developing a, a habit of noticing, am I above the line or below the line? And below the line is like constriction, fear, scarcity. Above the line is curiosity, openness, creativity. So just noticing like, and their premise is that most of us spend like 90% of us spend 90% of the time below the line. So it's not about like fighting against being below the line. It's just noticing like, oh, and, and I personally have experienced a close relationship between that and a mindset of separation. It's like, again, my premise about that is like, because when we withdraw and separate ourselves from the rest of life, that's a pretty vulnerable, scary place to be in. And so we naturally go into fear and constriction. Um, and so those conscious leadership group tools can be really helpful just for developing that basic somatic capacity, emotional intelligence, just like more full body humanness. Which is what you brought us to with one of the meditations earlier in the yes, presentation. Yes, thank you for going there with me. Hundred percent. Well, you, you it was a reason you did it. <laughs> it was an important point, which, yeah, can be brought full circle now. Well, our our, our time is up, and we got a few questions remaining, but we always do have questions we weren't able to address. Thank you very much for your um your work and your presence and your beinghood. Um, um, any any final final comments or or bits you'd like to leave us with? Um, well, obviously I hope everyone goes and checks out the Food Integrity Collective website and, um, maybe just an invitation to at some point in your day or evening, depending where you are, just find another moment to really connect joyfully with a heart full of gratitude to the beauty and abundance of nature and the fact that it is naturally regenerative that is the state of living systems is that they regenerate and our work is to entrain ourselves to that reality so that we can be in service of it and each and every one of us is a part of that with with just the choices we make with how we orient to the world so i appreciate this chance to be with you all and hope everyone has a beautiful rest of your day and thank you so much dan i always love spending time with you love that you're doing this and thank you for inviting me my pleasure. Thank you for thank you for coming on. All right. Great. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Bye.